Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel and welcome to Creep Week. As I'm sure a lot of you guys have noticed, I don't really cover serial killer cases here on my channel and that's because I try to cover cases that the media hasn't covered too much and that need more awareness spread on their cases. But for the spirit of Halloween, I wanted to cover one of the creepiest serial killer cases that are out there and let me tell you guys, this one is crazy. This is the case of the Long Island serial killer, which is still an unsolved case, so we don't know who the perpetrator is. There is so much to this case, and because it's still unsolved, it's still a case that needs to get out there, it needs more attention, it needs more eyes on it to hopefully bring this person to justice. For this case, I did want to split it into two parts because when I tell you there's so much to this case, I am not lying. I fully dove into this one, I drew diagrams, I drew a timeline to map out all the years and the victims. There are so many layers to this case that if I tried to do it all in one go, it would be very overwhelming. So welcome to part one of the Long Island serial killer case. Also, before anyone says it in the comments, I know I'm a little bit congested, I'm not sick or anything, I feel fine, I just have a little bit of like a sinus thing going on, I have a little bit of a dry throat, but that's pretty much expected in Arizona, so there's that. I do apologize if I sound stuffy or congested. That's just how I woke up this morning. So I do apologize if I sound a little bit different today or if I don't enunciate on things as well because I am a little bit congested. So I just wanted to put that out there while I'm thinking about it. But before we get into it, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Babbel. So I did take Spanish in high school, but pretty much the minute I graduated, I completely forgot everything because I just did not stick with it but I love to travel. I like to go to places like Mexico and Costa Rica. And I actually just got back from a trip to Mexico just a couple of days ago. So knowing how to speak a little bit of Spanish and understanding Spanish is such an important skill when you're traveling to those countries that speak Spanish. Also, I live in Arizona and we have a lot of Spanish speakers here and working in healthcare, it's so important to be able to help and understand all patients, including Spanish speakers. Babbel is great because they teach you real world practical conversations through short 10 minute lessons. Plus their lessons are designed by actual language teachers, not by algorithms or AI. They also use speech recognition in their lessons, which is great for me because a lot of my longtime viewers know that I do struggle to pronounce a lot of things, so getting feedback on how I'm actually pronouncing these words is so helpful for me. Mis padres son profesores. ¿Quién eres? Yo soy Claudia. ¿Ustedes son de Colombia? Ever since starting Babbel, I feel like I have such a greater ability to make connections with people while I'm traveling, understand what people are saying when I'm trying to ask them for help with different things in these countries, and I'm able to understand my Spanish speaker patients so much better. There is a reason that Babbel is the number one language learning app in the world, and it's because their lessons are so helpful and so easy to navigate. They use award-winning, scientifically proven technology to get you speaking the new language in just three weeks. Start speaking a new language in just three weeks with Babbel. You can get 60% off of your subscription when you use my link down below. Let me know in the comments what language you want to start learning and why. Again, use my link down below and you can get 60% off of your Babbel subscription. Thank you again to Babbel so much for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into the case. We are going to be starting off with the woman whose disappearance prompted the searches and discovery of the Long Island serial killer. Shannon Maria Gilbert was born on October 25th, 1986 in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and she had three younger sisters. Sherry, who was a year younger, Sarah, who was two years younger than Shannon, as well as a half-sister named Stevie. Shannon definitely did not have an easy life from the very start. When Shannon was five years old, the girl's mother, Mari, left her husband, Shannon, and her sister's father and moved away from their hometown of Lancaster to upstate New York. Then they moved once again to Ellenville, New York. Mari told her daughters that she had to leave him because he was doing heroin. 
After this, the girls never saw their father again. When Shannon was seven years old, her mother Mari realized that she was no longer able to take care of Shannon, so Shannon was placed into foster care. By all accounts, the foster homes she was placed into were decently well kept and she was well taken care of, but obviously she was now separated from her sisters. She was absolutely devastated to even be in this situation. She saw her sisters at school and she would often run away back home to be with her siblings. When Mari was later asked why Shannon was the one who was sent into foster care, Mari admitted that Shannon was just a very difficult kid to deal with. She had a binge eating problem, she had severe mood swings, and she would often act out in extreme ways from the time that she was very young. These things though, did start making sense when she was 12 years old because she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. But even though she did have the diagnosis and she had a prescription of medication to take, Shannon did not take her medication because she hated the way it made her feel. Now, while Shannon was in the foster care system, it seemed that her sisters didn't have it much better living at home anyways. Sherry, Sarah, and Stevie all suffered abuse at the hands of one of Mari's boyfriends, this did include being sexually molested by him, but by the time he was out of the picture and he was completely gone from their lives, the trauma from the abuse didn't go with him. They had long-lasting side effects that pretty much stuck with them forever, as it does in these types of abuse cases. Sarah found herself pregnant at the age of 14, which ended up in her getting an abortion. She dropped out of school at the age of 16 and moved in with a 22-year-old man named Manny, who was a drug dealer. The two ended up having a son together, but the relationship between Manny and Sarah was very tumultuous. The two would break up and make up all of the time. Manny had been arrested several times for drug-related offenses, and Sara had ended up in domestic abuse shelters from time to time due to how Manny was treating her. At the same time as Sara's struggles, Shannon actually graduated from New Paltz Central High School a year early at the age of 16. However, throughout high school, she began dabbling in drugs and alcohol. Despite this, though, she was able to keep up her grades in school and, again, graduate early. She had dreams of becoming a singer-slash-songwriter or actress. However, after graduating early, it seemed that Shannon had this new urge for independence and creating her own self-image. She dyed her dark brown hair blonde and she started wearing heavy makeup. After high school, Shannon went on to work at a hotel and then in Applebee's and then at a senior center. However, by 2007, she decided to move in with her boyfriend who lived in New Jersey. At this time, she realized that these low-paying jobs just weren't cutting it for her. She had bigger dreams. So, in order to make the money while living on her own in New Jersey, Shannon had actually signed herself up to work for an escort agency. She had been working for sort of an established prostitution ring called Lace Party Girls. This is where she met her boyfriend and her driver, Alex Diaz. It was said that the two actually had a pretty decent relationship at first, but Lace Party Girls had actually gotten shut down, so Shannon's money flow stopped. At this point, Shannon had had to get a few abortions to get rid of any unwanted pregnancies, and her occasional drug use turned into regular drug use. She started doing drugs like cocaine and ecstasy with her clients, and she had also been regularly drinking. At this point, Shannon moved in with Alex's dad in Jersey City, and she started looking for different agencies to work for. At this time, Alex and Shannon's relationship began to crumble. They would fight all of the time, and things would get physical pretty often. There was one night where Shannon came home and she was very intoxicated and the two had gotten into a pretty intense argument and then things turned into a physical fight and Alex punched Shannon in the jaw so hard that she fractured her jaw and she needed surgery and that included getting a titanium plate put into her jaw to fix up the fracture. So after this, by 2010, she started placing her own ads to Craigslist for her escort services. She would charge $200 for the hour and she was able to keep two-thirds of the profits for herself and then one-third went towards her driver who would take her from place to place and then would sort of just stick around the area 
area to add this extra layer of security so that Shannon wasn't going to all of these houses by herself. However, Shannon definitely did not want sex work or escorting to be her forever gig. With the money she earned, she eventually was able to get her own apartment in Jersey City where she lived by herself. She had also started doing some online college courses to eventually get a more normal and safe job and she was starting to go to singing auditions in Manhattan. At the same time though, Shannon had a bit of a habit of wanting to spend all of her extra money on her loved ones. She loved buying her nieces and nephews special gifts, but Mari knew where all of this money was coming from. According to Mari, she really tried getting Shannon to stop doing sex work. She offered Shannon to come in and live with her so that she could get her life back on track, but Shannon was not ready to give up her lifestyle. She basically told her mom that she barely has to do any work and she was making thousands of dollars for doing it. At the same time, Mari did get her own life back on track and she was able to give Shannon help if she would accept it, but Shannon never wanted the help. So, on the night of May 1st, 2020 at around 2 a.m., 24-year-old Shannon was picked up in a dark-colored SUV by her driver, Michael Pack. She was visiting a man who had responded to one of the ads that she placed on Craigslist. This was a 46-year-old unemployed former financial advisor who had just separated from his wife. His name was Joseph Brewer. According to Michael, he dropped Shannon off at Joseph's two-story home on Fairway Drive in Oak Beach, Long Island, in a quiet, gated community located only a few miles from Fire Island along the South Oyster Bay. After dropping her off, Michael said that he waited in his SUV and just sort of sat in there and played poker on his phone. Another witness from that night reports that sometime after, you know, 2 a.m., they saw Shannon and Joseph coming out of his house and then going into Joseph's car and then returning back to his house 15 minutes later. It's not clear exactly where they were going, but Michael would say that if Shannon was looking for drugs, this would explain why she left for a short period of time and then went back inside. By that point, Shannon called Mike on the phone to let him know that she was going to be extending her night with Joseph. However, by 5 a.m., after spending about three hours together, Joseph came out of his house once again, but this time approached Michael in his SUV and asked for help with Shannon, telling him to come get his girl because she is freaking out. After going inside, Michael saw that Shannon was in an absolute panic. She was clutching her phone and it turned out that at 4.51 a.m., Shannon had called 911. Now, 911 had not released this call for literally 10 years after this all happened. So, I do want to point out that for the initial stages of this investigation, the public did not know the contents of this call. I also want to mention that reading a lot of articles before this phone call was released, there was a lot of different speculation and a lot of different reports of what was in this call. But after listening to it myself, obviously we know a much more accurate version of this call. Now, when she first started the call, she started by saying that somebody is after her, that she doesn't know where she is, just that somebody is after her. Now, before this phone call was released, the public did know that there were voices in the background, but it hadn't been released who these voices belonged to. After listening to the call, it's pretty obvious that these voices belong to Joseph and Mike. In the background, both Michael and Joseph can be heard trying to talk to Shannon and trying to comfort her. Joseph is trying to get Shannon to get out of his house while Michael is asking her if she's okay. But she barely responds to either of them, pretty much just saying no the entire time. Again, both of them were asking her what was wrong, if she's okay, and Joseph was trying to get her to leave. She is heard asking them if they're going to kill her, and obviously they say they're not. They say that they're just trying to get her to leave. Mike would later go on to say that he was just trying to get Shannon to come with him this entire time, but she was refusing. He said she was just in this complete panic this entire time. She wouldn't comply with anything that they were trying to get her to do. 
Michael thinks that maybe she was on drugs at this point because she was acting completely delirious. So at this point, Michael says that he just got really frustrated and he left the house and went back into his SUV to wait for Shannon. After about a minute or two though of Mike waiting outside, he sees Shannon just bolting out of Joseph's house. She stumbled down the steps and started running down the road. Michael said that he followed her with the SUV, but she continued running down the street, yelling and screaming for help. These screams are also heard in the 911 call. This is when she arrived to a neighbor's house who lived three houses down. This neighbor was a 75-year-old man named Gustav Coletti. He had already been up and getting ready for the day when he heard Shannon banging very loudly on his door. Of course, he went down to answer the door to see what was wrong, and she told him that somebody was after her. After this, she leaves Gustav's house and then runs another 0.2 miles, and this is also when Shannon hangs up with this 911 call. After this, Gustav also called the police. In this call, he said that he had just seen a girl who looked to be around 14 years old, which we know that she was actually 24 years old, but to him, she looked 14. And he said that she was being followed by a black SUV, which makes sense because we know that Mike was the one following behind her in the black SUV. So first, I'm going to play the entirety of Shannon's 911 call, and then I'm going to play Gustav's 911 call. State Police, Trooper Fry. State Police. Yeah, there's somebody after me. I'm sorry? There's somebody after me. Where are you? There's somebody after me. Okay, where are you? There's somebody after me. Where are you, ma'am? I don't know. You're driving right now? No, I'm inside the house. I'm sorry? I'm inside the house. What house? I don't know. Can you trace where I am? I'm sorry? Can you trace where I am? No, I can't. What's your callback number you're calling from? Huh? What phone number are you calling from? Somebody's asking me. Please. Are you in Suffolk County or Nassau County? Um, I'm in Long Island. Where on Long Island are you? No. 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 No, stop, no. Where in Long Island are you? In Suffolk County? Nassau County? Huh? Oh. All right. Why are you calling me by my name? Why? County, you on the line? Stop. Please. Stop it, please. Please stop. Please. Can you shut the door? No, time to go. Please. 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 Go that way, please. Come on, let's go. Come on, roll that side. 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 No, please. Come on. Come on, please. Come on. Please. Come on. Why? Come on. 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 Please, get to the kitchen. Mike, hold. Mike, what's the matter? Are you okay? What are you going to do? What are you going to do to me? Why? Huh? Are you okay? Well, I don't know, but it was canceled to me. Why? No, no. Are you going to tell me? I think it's just a county in the mansion. Why are you gonna keep it? Close stuff at home. I'm in the middle of nowhere. Let's go back to the hall. Let's go back to Manhattan. All right. We're in Long Island. We're out near the water. Please stop. Please, Mike. 
No, stop it, please. Hello? Hello? Please. What's what's the pro what's the matter? What happened? Hello? Please, get me out of here, Lee. Hello? You're being sarcastic about this. You were part of this all along. I just met him just now. Shannon. Yes, this uh, I live at Oak Beach in the association. And there's a young girl about 14 years old running around here screaming, and there's some guy trying to follow her. What's the address there? I'm at 17 The Fairway. All right, you have a description of the girl or the boy? Pardon me? You have a description of the girl or the boy? The girl is about 14 years old, got blonde hair, very small. The boy, I can't tell. He was into like a, a, a suburban. What color? Uh, black. Did you happen to get a plate number or any? Plate? No, I didn't. Okay, telephone number you're calling from? Fourth. Are they still on the fairway? Uh, they just went past the gatehouse where the entrance is. And what's the name of the complex? It's Oak Beach Association. Okay. Out okay. by Robert Moses. All right, we got somebody over there. I'll be watching. Oh, okay. Okay, so after these two 911 calls from Shannon and Gustav, Shannon ended up at another home in the neighborhood. This home belonged to a woman named Barbara Brennan. Shannon had been incessantly knocking on Barbara's door and she continued to yell and scream that she was in danger. So here's that 911 call. Suffolk Police 875, what is the location of your emergency? Uh, 40. 43 The Bayou. Some woman is knocking at my door. What town are you in? Oak Beach Association. What's the nearest corner street now? Uh, Ocean Parkway. She says she's in danger. Do you know her or no? No, I don't. I'm not letting her in. She's banging on your door now? Yes. Did she say what kind of danger? No. Oh. And we live in a gated community. What's your name, ma'am? Uh, Barbara Brennan. Was there a name to that community? Uh, Oak Beach Association. Oak Beach Association. And I have an elderly mother here. All right, I'll get somebody right over there, okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. After Shannon ran away from Barbara's house, though, Michael said that he completely lost sight of her and he has no idea where she went after that. He said that he drove around for about an hour looking for Shannon, but he couldn't find her anywhere. So he gave up in the search and he drove himself back to the city, but he didn't say anything to Shannon's family or Alex, her boyfriend, about her going missing. He said, though, that he was under the assumption that Shannon had made it home that night somehow. He didn't know that she had been missing until Alex and her family called him the next day, asking him where she was. So going back to the night where Shannon originally ran off, after the 911 call, police did not show up for another 45 minutes, and this was after Gustav's 911 call. 
When they looked for her in those initial hours, the only traces that they found of Shannon were footprints leading towards the sand, leading towards an empty stretch of shore called Gilgo Beach. So, in the area where Shannon went missing, there's a lot of marshland with very tall bush that can grow to be over 12 feet tall. There's also a trench that was made through the bush that is made for mosquito control. It's thought that maybe she took this path and because of how tall the bush is that maybe she just got completely disoriented and lost where she she was going, but no matter how hard police looked for her in this marsh, they could not find any trace of her. By this point, Alex had gone to the police station to file a missing persons report for Shannon. After this, Shannon was never seen or heard from again. Now, in the days following Shannon's disappearance, both Michael and Joseph were questioned. They searched Joseph's car and his house, but they didn't find any conclusive evidence. They also searched Mike's car, but they didn't find any evidence in there either. According to Joseph and Michael, they say that they actually took and passed polygraph tests, but police have not confirmed or deny this, and we also know that obviously polygraph tests are not the most accurate, so doesn't really matter whether they did or not, and I'm not sure whether they did or not because police have not said if they did or not. When Joseph was questioned, he actually claimed that he didn't even sleep with Shannon. He actually said that he just wanted her company after dealing with a very bad divorce. He said that he also did not have any drugs, nor did he see Shannon using any. So, she wasn't in any sort of drug-induced panic, according to Joseph, because he didn't see her doing any drugs that night. So, if she did do drugs, it was before she got there, and I guess they must have hit hours later. But I don't believe that he didn't sleep with her. He probably just didn't want to get arrested for eliciting prostitution. So, he, of course, is going to say that he didn't sleep with her, but I don't believe that at all. After looking into both of these men, however, police found nothing conclusive that led them to believe that they had anything to do with Shannon's disappearance. They also looked into Gustav, who was one of the men who saw her that night, and he didn't seem to have any involvement either. They did continue searching the area, but they weren't able to find any sign of her anywhere. That was until December 11th, 2010, just before the first snowfall of the season, a Suffolk County detective was training his cadaver dog on the side of the road in Gilgo Beach, just down Ocean Parkway from Fairway Drive in Oak Beach. At this point, the dog discovered a set of human remains decomposing to the point that they were just skeletal remains. They were located on the beach about three miles away from Joseph's home. At this point, police thought that it was very possible that these remains belonged to Shannon because they were located right near where she went missing. But after sending these bones for an autopsy, it was found that the skull did not have a titanium plate in the jaw just like Shannon had. So, there's no way that these remains could belong to Shannon. Two days later, police were back out in the area doing their searches and at this point, they found three additional sets of human remains, which were all skeletal remains at this point. All four sets of remains had no identifiable items with them, no clothing, no jewelry, no IDs, nothing like that. But they were all wrapped in burlap and they were all buried about 500 feet apart from one another. Then, in addition to this, they were all buried about 50 feet out from the edge of Ocean Parkway. So, all of these bodies were buried in a very methodical way, one right next to the other. According to police, based on the autopsies that were done on these bodies, it was believed that each of these victims had died as a result of strangulation. Now, at this point, Shannon's remains had not been found. However, after examining all of the remains that were found, it was found that all of these remains belonged to young women. So, now I will be discussing the identities of the first four women found on Gilgo Beach who went on to be known as the Gilgo Four. First was 25-year-old Maureen Bernard Barnes. Maureen was born on June 14th, 1982, and she was also a sex worker who posted her ads on Craigslist, Backpage, and similar websites. 
She was tiny, standing at 4 feet 11 inches tall, and she was described as a girl who loved writing poetry and song lyrics. She wasn't really interested in material possessions, and she didn't really wear makeup, and she was a straight-A student in high school. That was before she dropped out of high school at the age of 17, after she found herself pregnant with her high school sweetheart, Jason. After that, she got married to Jason, and she got her GED, but shortly after, the two did get a very amicable divorce, and and they decided to share custody of their daughter, Caitlin, but Caitlin was going to live with her father, Jason, because he lived in a better school district. From there, Maureen moved in with her little sister, and she worked pretty normal jobs. She worked at a gas station and a ShopRite store. She continued to love writing poems, and she had big dreams of someday becoming a rapper. But by 2006, she had even bigger dreams of becoming a model, and she uploaded her photos to a website where she thought that maybe she could get discovered discovered and this could jumpstart her modeling career. At this time, as she was living with her little sister, she was also staying on and off again with her friend named Jay. The two did have a sexual relationship together, but she mostly enjoyed his company because he also had a little daughter who was only a year older than her daughter, Caitlin, so the two could bond and play while Jay and Maureen hung out. At this point, as all of this was happening and she had this relationship with Jay, she was connected with someone who said that they wanted to take more pictures of her and jumpstart her modeling career. However, through all of that, she was then introduced into the world of escorting. She had a friend who actually showed her how to make this work by posting her own ads to Craigslist rather than signing up with an agency where she'd obviously have to split her profits with Craigslist, she could keep all of the money for herself. So she started doing out calls where she would go to their houses through these ads on Craigslist and she was making a good deal of money. After this, she did have a period where she got pregnant again with another boyfriend, Steve, and this time she had a baby boy named Aiden. At this point, while she was pregnant, she did stop escorting, but after having her second baby, she started things back up. She also started dabbling in drugs such as cocaine and ecstasy. She had lived in Norwich, Connecticut, but she would often travel to Manhattan for her work as an escort. Now, she also had another female friend who would travel with her sometimes who was also an escort, and there were times that they would often have a male friend to come with them to where they would work. Now, Maureen was last seen on July 9th, 2007 at 11.43 p.m. when she called a friend back in Connecticut to let him know that she was doing an out call with a client. She really needed to do a call this particular weekend because she needed the money to pay her rent and avoid eviction, and her client in Long Island was offering her $1,500 for the night. So, because this was sort of a last minute call and she was traveling to Long Island, the friends that normally came with her to add a little bit of layer of protection did not come with her this time. That next day on July 10th, she actually had a court hearing in regards to her son, Aiden, but when she didn't show up, her family knew that this was not like her because this was an important court hearing and there's no way that she would just choose not to show up. And it was at this point, after they called around to different people, that they realized that nobody had seen her. So, her sister reported her missing on July 14th, 2007. The next body that they found on December 11th, 2010 belonged to Melissa Bartholomew, who went missing two years after Maureen. Melissa was born April 14th, 1985, and she was 24 years old when she went missing, and she too was tiny, standing at 4 feet 10 inches tall. She was from Buffalo, New York, in an area that is known for being very run down and for having a lot of gang activity and a lot of crime. Her mother, Lynn, was only 16 years old when Melissa was born, so Melissa spent a lot of her time at her grandparents' home growing up. Melissa was known as having a very fiery personality. She was assertive and dominant, and she was known to stand up to anybody who Melissa thought wronged her. Lynn did have a very rough time raising Melissa when she was younger, 
but when Melissa was a teenager, she tried to do whatever she could to try and keep Melissa on the right path and out of trouble. However, throughout her time in school, Melissa started spending her time with some very unsavory people and she started slacking off in school. She also started dating the local drug dealer in the area. And at this point, Melissa's mother knew that she needed to do something extreme to try and get her out of this path that she was starting to go down. So Melissa was sent off to live with her father, Mark, in Texas. She lived there for about two years, but when she was about to turn 18, she actually took her dad's truck and drove it all the way back to Buffalo without her dad's permission and without having a license. Here in Buffalo, she finished off her senior year of high school and once again, she started dating her ex-boyfriend, the drug dealer. Her family really tried to keep her away from him, but she just would not listen. She was a high schooler. She was very rebellious, and we all know that when it comes to a teenager, the more you try to keep them away from a certain person, the more they're gonna want to be with that certain person. Either way, Melissa had always wanted to be a hairstylist. She saw her mom working so hard throughout her entire life, and she didn't want that life for herself. She wanted to wait until she was much older to have children, until she was like 30 or 35. She wanted to get a job, take care of her mother, and give her mother all of the things that Melissa didn't have growing up. After graduating from high school and getting her cosmetology license, Melissa got her first job at a Supercuts in Buffalo. This definitely was not her dream job, but at the time, it was the only job that she could get. By 2006, Melissa and her boyfriend started taking trips over to New York City to visit his uncle who owned a recording studio. That same year, Melissa told her mom that she was going to be moving to New York because she was actually offered a job cutting hair at a barber shop. She really thought that this was going to be a really great opportunity. It seemed like a really cool opportunity. She could live in downtown New York and she was going to be able to accomplish her dreams. But once she moved to Manhattan, she realized that there was no hair cutting job and at this time, her and her then boyfriend had broken up. This is where she met another boy named Johnny who went by Blaze, and she started working as an escort. At the time, Blaze was working as her pimp, but he was also her boyfriend. But there came a time that she was working for long enough and hard enough that she decided that she wanted to work for herself. At this time, she had been working on the streets. She was walking up and down the busy streets of New York all day, every day, trying to get men to part with their hard-earned money. She had been offered protection by Blaze, but for all of the work that she was doing, she had to share her profits, but she didn't want to keep doing that because she was making this money herself and she didn't think that she needed Blaze anymore. So she stopped reporting back to Blaze and started putting up her own ads on Craigslist. Again, she was tired of walking up and down the streets and approaching men and trying to convince them to let her do her work. Instead, she could now post these ads herself, they would call her, and they would come pick her up. This was much easier. Melissa then started doing out calls only. She charged $100 for 15 minutes of her time, $250 for an hour, and $1,000 for overnight. And just like with Shannon, once she was making a lot of money, she would go home to her family and she wanted to buy everybody expensive gifts. She took her mom out for spa days and everything like that. All this time, she told her family that she had just been dancing at a club, but her mom actually knew better and she knew that the lifestyle that she was living was much more dangerous than she was letting on. But there was one time where Melissa was visiting her family and she seemed a bit down and she was almost convinced to move back home. This whole time, her mom had been trying to convince her to just stop escorting and to just come home. Her family wanted to support her and they wanted to welcome her back with open arms and do whatever they could to continue supporting her. 
but she said that she wasn't going to take crap from anyone and she would be okay on her own. Now, when Blaze found out about Melissa going behind his back, there was one incident where him and a group of women had found Melissa and confronted her and they beat her. After that, he really didn't want to have anything to do with Melissa anymore. By July 11th, 2009, Melissa had been back in New York City and a security camera had captured her depositing $1,000 into her account. The next day, on July 12th, she was seen sitting outside on a curb right outside of her apartment in the Bronx. That night, her phone records showed that she had made a call to Blaze, but the call lasted under a minute, so that could have just been the call going straight to voicemail. It was thought that she was probably waiting for a ride from somebody at that time. But either way, after Melissa went missing, Blaze would go on to say that he actually knew that she was going on a date somewhere in Long Island with a big spender who offered her $1,000 for the night but because they didn't work together anymore, he didn't want anything to do with this call. So he avoided her call and that is why it just went to voicemail. The next day on July 13th, when she had completely stopped responding to any phone calls and text messages from her loved ones, her friends started calling around to local hospitals to see if she ended up there, but nobody could locate her. So the next step was to file a missing persons report, but police would not have any of it. They actually waited 10 days before they would bother to send anybody out to go around looking for her and obviously it's thought that this was because of her work in escorting. They did look around the area where she went missing, but there was no sign of her anywhere. After she went missing though, Melissa's little sister, Amanda, started receiving phone calls from Melissa's cell phone. The person on the other line would say things that personally identified Amanda. Now, Melissa was white because both of her parents were obviously white, but Amanda's father was black, so Amanda was half white and half black. The person during one of these phone calls referred to Amanda as a half-breed. In total, there were seven calls. Most of them were just the person taunting her. They would ask her questions like, are you a whore like your sister? And things like that. After alerting police to these phone calls, they were traced back to areas of Manhattan like Times Square and another back to Massapeka, a town just north of Gilgo Beach. So very, very populated areas. The last call was in August of 2009. And in this call, the person basically told them that he had killed Melissa. They said, quote, I'm watching your sister's body rot. After this last call, Amanda and her mother were worried that this person knew where they lived, so the both of them moved. Blaze also came out to say that he too received phone calls from Melissa's cell phone and this person knew information about him as well. This person knew about what tattoos he had and where, where he worked and where he traveled. Both Amanda and Blaze described the man on the other line as sounding like a white man in his 30s to 40s who didn't have any sort of identifiable accent. He didn't have a New York accent or a New Jersey accent or anything that stood out to them. In these phone calls, he also sounded weirdly calm and collected. He wasn't aggressive. He wasn't excited. He wasn't mocking. He was just very calm. He sounded like he knew exactly what he was doing and he knew what to do to avoid being caught. Again, any calls that police were able to track were traced back to very densely populated areas such as Times Square. One of the calls was actually traced back to a specific burner phone, but the name listed as the account holder on this phone was listed as Mickey Mouse. Nothing was found in Melissa's case until, as we know, her remains were found on December 13th. The next body belonged to 22-year-old Megan Waterman, who was born January 18th, 1988. Megan was from Scarborough, Maine, and she had a very rough childhood. Her mother, Lorraine, was a lifelong alcoholic who struggled to raise her. 
There were accusations of abuse and neglect by Megan's grandmother, Muriel, who filed for custody of Megan and her younger brother. Eventually, Megan and her little brother did get taken away and put into foster care. After this, Lorraine did nothing to fight for her children to come back, but Muriel was fighting every single weekend to get custody of both of them from foster care. So Lorraine and her boyfriend at the time, who was Megan's little brother's dad, but not Megan's dad, but I'm sure he was her legal guardian, but either way, both of them signed away their rights to Muriel as being their legal guardian. When she was a child, Megan was diagnosed with ADHD and she was known for always getting into trouble. She was described as being defiant, fearless, and reckless. She would get into trouble for getting into fights and shoplifting from the local Walmart. And by the age of 17, she became pregnant with a man who was in his 30s and dropped out of high school. By the summer of 2006, she gave birth to her daughter, Liliana. Having a daughter definitely helped her calm down and made her want to be more responsible. She was described as being a fun, loving mother and she would do anything for Liliana. However, because of the added responsibility of taking care of a daughter, she now felt that she needed to do anything in her power to provide for her and protect her. At this point, she met a man named Akeem Cruz, who was from New York and was a gang member. He had been in and out of jail for drugs and illegal weapon possession from the time that he was a teenager. So instead of facing the charges that he had in New York, he fled to Maine, which is where Megan lived. By October of 2009, Megan started working as an escort and she too was posting her ads to Craigslist and Backpage. Lorraine would go on to say that she believed that Akeem forced Megan to start working as an escort. Also because of Akeem's involvement in drugs, Megan too did eventually start using especially drugs like cocaine, but Akeem actually got busted for possession and of course, he had his other warrants, so he ended up in jail, but he posted his $50,000 bail, but because of this, because of all the money that he just spent, he needed to make up some of that money as quickly as possible. Megan was last seen on June 6th, 2010, when her family saw her boarding a train in Maine heading towards New York. She was known to stay in various hotels in Long Island, and on the night of her disappearance, she was staying at the Holiday Express Inn in Hopage. I am sorry if I pronounced that wrong. I'm sure I am. Normally, Akeem would go with her on any of the calls that she got, but at this time, she did go it alone. She was supposed to be going to Long Island because she was promised $1,500 for a night. At some point in the night, she called her grandmother, who was a frequent babysitter for Lily, she also called her mother, who at the time she was working on building a relationship back up with. So after this, she left her hotel at around 1.30 a.m. on June 6th after calling Akeem to let him know that she was going to be leaving the hotel to stop at a local convenience store first. By June 7th, Akeem started to get worried that Megan had not returned. He started calling her friends and her family to see if anybody had seen her, but of course, nobody had. He went to her hotel to see if she had been seen that evening or that day, but she wasn't there. But of course, because he was involved in so much criminal activity, he didn't immediately report her as a missing person to the police. So by June 8th, when her friends and family still had not seen or heard from her in many days, they did report her as a missing person. They knew that she just would not go this many days without checking in on her daughter, so they knew that something had to have happened to her. After she was reported missing, this was actually many years after she went missing, but police did end up releasing a surveillance video from the lobby of the Holiday Inn Express where she was last seen. Now, Akeem was arrested for charges of interstate sex trafficking in April of 2012, and for this, he was sentenced to three years behind bars. However, there has been nothing in the investigation to show that he had any involvement in Megan's disappearance. After this, police weren't really able to find anything else that could lead them in any direction or give them any answers 
until, of course, her remains were found on Gilgo Beach. Next, we have 27-year-old Amber Lim Castello, who was born in October of 1983. She grew up in an upper middle class family and she had an older sister named Kim who was six years older than her. But despite them being far apart in age, the two were very close growing up. She grew up in a suburb of Charlotte, North Carolina, and she had a relatively normal life for the first few years of her life. Her family had family dinners together and their family as a whole was described as being cheery and outgoing. However, when Amber was only five years old, she was actually raped by a 26-year-old man who lived next door to them. On that day, he invited the young girl to go play tennis with him down the street, but instead, he raped her. It's not known exactly what happened afterwards. He could have gone to prison, but we don't really know. There's also rumors that Amber's dad had actually went to this man and put his shotgun to his head and threatened his life after he found out. But again, we don't really know. After this though, unfortunately, the entire family just fell apart. Amber's mother suffered from such severe panic attacks that she ended up in the hospital. Her father began to abuse alcohol after he was left to take care of the children all on his own and he was arrested for DUIs more than once. After this, Kim, Amber's older sister, took on the responsibility of basically raising little Amber. Kim ended up working two jobs just to get herself through college so that she could take care of Amber as well as her parents. After that, Kim started to work in the world of escorting through an established ring. Then, shortly after Kim started, once Amber was in her teenage years, she also followed suit. Once Amber was in her teen years, she started working alongside her sister, Kim. Now, this ring was also known for dealing with drugs, so a lot of the girls working for this ring had also grew a drug addiction. Kim began to struggle with cocaine, but Amber, she started using heroin. Eventually, Amber did reach out to the church to ask for help, and there was a pastor there who was very willing to help her, and he grew to being like a father to her. But this pastor had actually died, and this affected Amber so much that she relapsed. After this, Amber and Kim moved to Clearwater, Florida to basically start a new life. Amber got clean once again and she started working for a church. She actually met a man there and the two got married, but because of the brutal rape that she suffered, she struggled to have children as a result of the permanent damage that was left in her body, so she couldn't conceive. So the two ended up adopting a child together, a little boy named Gabriel. A year after that, Amber's mother did end up passing away, but either way, she seemed to have her life together. She talked to her father about trying to get involved in the church, and she tried to help him get his life back together as well. But this did not last long because her marriage with her husband quickly fizzled out, and she started shoplifting, and she was arrested for charges of theft, but before she could face charges, she just left Florida. For some time, both Amber and Kim were going all across the East Coast to do their escorting services. But eventually, Kim met a nice man who helped Kim get her life back on path. They moved back to North Carolina and Kim got a normal job. It was said that this man named Dave treated Kim like a princess and he did whatever he could to get Amber's life back on track as well. Throughout this time though, Amber did start using heroin again, but Dave, Kim's boyfriend, helped Amber get into a very reputable drug rehab and he visited her every weekend. In rehab, Amber met a man who went by the name Bear. He also had a very troubled life, being arrested for breaking and entering charges multiple times, as well as drug use. 
But the two got very close, and he told Amber that he had an infant son, and he wanted to get his life back together because he wanted to get back on track and back to raising his son. After this, Amber and Bear moved back in with David and Kim, where they now lived in Babylon, New York. And Dave continued to do whatever he could to help keep their lives on track, but shortly after, Kim and Amber both realized that they were in need of money, so they started escorting again. They started back up with posting their ads on Backpage and Craigslist, and they started making money. But this lifestyle led them right back into using drugs, and their drug use affected everybody who lived in the house. Dave had actually never really had a big problem with drug use. He had a small time where he was using painkillers, but other than that, he never had any sort of serious issues, but at that point, Amber, Dave, and Bear were all using heroin while Kim continued using cocaine. Bear ended up being caught with drugs on him, and he got arrested and ended up in jail. Now, Amber was able to gather up enough money to pay his bail, but after getting out, Bear decided to break things off with Amber because he said that he really needed to get his life back together for his baby boy. So Amber continued living with Dave in Babylon, New York, and Amber continued looking for clients. Amber was last seen on September 2nd, 2010, after she left her home on foot to go meet up with a client who was supposed to be picking her up at her home. This client was also someone who was offering her $1,500 for a night in Long Island. She had been walking down the road at night to meet up with this man, but she hadn't brought her cell phone with her. Now, Kim wasn't home at the time, so she didn't even know that Amber left or what the situation was surrounding her leaving. Then Dave was home, but he was too high on heroin to have any idea of what was going on. So nobody reported Amber as missing. Kim would go on to say that she really thought that Amber had just left on her own accord, and Dave did get worried at one point, and he said that maybe she is actually missing, maybe something did happen to her, but Kim assured her that Amber would be back soon. At the end of the day, Kim just didn't want the police poking around in their business and finding out that they were using drugs and Kim was escorting. So nothing came of her disappearance until her body was found. So after hearing the description and situations surrounding these women, obviously we see a pattern. They all charged around $200 for an hour for their services, and they were offered around $1,000 to $1,500 for a night in Long Island right before they went missing. All of these women, of course, were sex workers. They were all in their 20s, and all of them were very short and petite. All of them advertised their services on Craigslist or similar websites. At this point, it was clear to police that all four of these women were victims of a serial killer who they went on to call the Long Island serial killer. But at this point, Shannon still had not been found, and it wasn't clear whether she was the victim of the same killer. As searches went on along Gilgo Beach, they weren't really able to find any evidence that could lead them to the identity of this killer, but they brought in their searches and they actually found many more gruesome discoveries. So going back quite a bit, back in July of 2003, the partial remains of a woman were found in a town called Matterville in Suffolk County in New York. Her body was found near a paved access road near a pile of tree branches and scrap wood. She was found naked and she was missing her head and her hands. It is thought that the killer had removed her head and her hands to avoid her being identified because he also tried scraping off the tattoo that she had on her back. But the medical examiner was able to piece together what the tattoo looked like and they released photos of it. After that, a detective from Washington, D.C. noticed that this tattoo belonged to a missing 20-year-old sex worker named Jessica Taylor. Now jumping forward to March 29th, 2011, about one mile east of the original site where these four women were found, police discovered a skull, forearm, and hands. DNA later revealed that these remains also belonged to Jessica Taylor. 
So she is now thought to be connected to the Long Island serial killer. As a note, Manorville and Gilgo Beach are about 40 miles apart from one another. As they continued searching between April 4th and April 11th, 2011, police found three additional sets of human remains between Oak Beach and Gilgo Beach. So, first, the remains of an unidentified Asian male dressed in women's clothing was discovered. It's believed that this victim may have been transgender. This man is thought to have been killed by blunt force trauma to the head. By September, a sketch was released of what this victim looks like. However, to this day, we do not know the identity of this victim. Then, police found the remains of a skull, hands, and foot. However, using DNA, these remains were connected to other remains that were found 11 years prior. Back in 2000, there was a torso found in Manorville as well, the same area where Jessica Taylor's torso was found. So, after these remains were connected, she was identified as Jane Doe number six. And she was known as Jane Doe number six until 10 years, until just recently in 2020, when she was finally identified using genetic genetic genealogy. Jane Doe number six is actually Valerie Mack. Valerie Mack was born in 1976 and she was 24 years old when she went missing. She was originally from Philadelphia. She had last been in contact with her family when she was in the area of Port Republic, New Jersey in the spring of 2000. She had also been working as an escort. And just like all of the other victims, she too was tiny, standing at five feet tall and weighing a hundred pounds. The next set of remains belong to an unidentified toddler between the ages of 16 and 24 months. This baby is a baby girl and she's referred to as Baby Doe and again, she still has not been identified. This baby was found wrapped in a blanket and there were no visible signs of trauma on her. So obviously this baby does not fit in with the rest of the other victims. So it's not known at this point if the killer responsible for these victims is also responsible for the death of this baby. However, in these April 2011 searches, police also discovered a plastic bag containing the arms and legs of a woman near Jones Beach State Park, about four miles away and a five-minute drive away from Gilgo Beach. This victim is referred to as Jane Doe number three. However, back in 1997, there was a hiker near Hampstead Lake State Park in Lakeview, New York, who discovered the naked torso of a woman stuffed into a garbage bag, which was then placed into a Rubbermaid container. When originally found, she was referred to as Peaches due to a distinctive tattoo of Peaches that she had on her left breast. She is known to be a black woman between the ages of 20 and 30 years old, but the police don't have enough of what she could have looked like to actually release a sketch of what she potentially looked like to try to identify her. So again, it wasn't until 2011 that Peaches was connected to being the same person as Jane Doe number three. But DNA testing later revealed that this victim, Jane Doe number three or Peaches, is actually the mother of Baby Doe. So my thought is that the killer had picked up peaches and was doing the escort services and maybe she had her baby in the car and the killer didn't know about this until after. So maybe the killer killed peaches and then, you know, looked in her car and saw that there was a baby there. So maybe the killer smothered her with her own blanket and then buried her on the beach. Or maybe she was found much later and she had died of natural causes, or I guess not natural causes because she would have died from being locked in a car and from starvation. So maybe the killer found her after that and then decided to bury her on the beach as well. So that could be the answer. It could not be. It could not be connected. I don't know if this is possible to not be connected at all, but Police don't really know, and obviously I don't really know, but I do think that this can lead us to a little bit more information. I think this could lead us to maybe this guy is leading the victims to Gilgo Beach to do these services. Maybe they're in his car, maybe it's at a hotel near Gilgo Beach, but I think that this means that at least at this time, they were near the area when 
he killed baby doe or when baby doe was found and when he was doing these escort services with peach so now going back to the bodies there was also a skull discovered along ocean parkway west of tobey beach about 2.5 miles away from gilgo beach and this victim was referred to as jane doe number seven however DNA also connected Jane Doe number seven to being another Jane Doe called Fire Island Jane Doe that was discovered back in 1996. So going way back to 1996, there was a set of legs discovered on Fire Island, which is around 15 miles and a 45 minute drive away from Gilgo Beach. And again, these legs were connected by DNA as belonging to the same person that was found on Gilgo Beach, Jane Doe number seven in 2011. So I know we just discussed a lot. And again, it might be harder to understand me because of how congested I am, but to review, there were a total of 10 bodies that were found right along Ocean Parkway. Here is a map of where each victim was found for you so that you have a visual of how far apart they were, when they were found, and where they all were. Now, initially, after finding all of these bodies, police did not think that they were the work of one killer. They thought that there was at least three killers involved. However, by November 29th of 2011, Police Commissioner Richard Dormer released a statement saying that the police department now believes that one serial killer is related to all 10 bodies that were found, but he still does not think that Shannon is connected. He thinks that it's just a coincidence that this young woman was running on Oak Beach and that she went missing in the area and that bodies were found just nearby because at this point, her body had not been found. However, Finally, at 9.14 a.m. on December 13th, 2011, nine months after she went missing, Shannon Gilbert's remains were finally found. She was found in the Oak Beach Marsh, about a quarter mile away from where her cell phone ID, jeans, and shoes were all found a few days earlier, along the path of cutout area that I discussed earlier, which was used for mosquito control. After finding her remains, Commissioner Dormer stated, quote, this may be just a young lady who ran into the brush in a hysterical state, fell down, and expired for some reason. After finding her body, of course, she was sent off to the medical examiner who did an autopsy and they actually found out that her cause of death was inconclusive. They theorized that in some sort of drug-induced panic, Shannon ran into the marsh and drowned. But I will note that this autopsy did not do any sort of toxicology report. However, by September of 2014, an independent forensic pathologist, Dr. Michael Badden, agreed to do an independent autopsy for Shannon to see if there was anything that police were missing. The results of the autopsy were released in February of 2016, and they were as follows. In a letter, he stated, quote, Almost all of the skeletal bones were recovered and appeared normal. There was no evidence of trauma. However, the larynx was missing, and only the body of the hyoid bone was found. The two greater horns of that neck bone were missing. These structures, the larynx and hyoid bones, are often fractured during homicidal manual strangulation. My examination of the recovered body of the hyoid bone after it had been anthropology defleshed showed a roughness at the margins where the separated horns had been attached. Toxicologic analysis was able to be performed on the skeletal muscle and contents of the cranial cavity. No drugs of abuse, including cocaine, were found. The death certificate was issued as cause of death undetermined, manner of death undetermined. Shannon's mother told me that her daughter had been in good health, no surgical procedures, no hospitalizations, and that she did use cocaine sometimes. In my opinion, based on the circumstances of Shannon's death and on the materials that I have reviewed, that there is no evidence that she died of natural disease or of a drug overdose or of drowning. There is insufficient information to determine a definite cause of death, but the autopsy findings are consistent with homicidal strangulation. So, I want to emphasize that in this toxicology report, there were no drugs found in Shannon's system. So, there's no way that she was freaking out in some sort of drug-induced, you know, delirium because she had no drugs in her system. So either she was freaking out because she had some sort of mental break 
remember she did have some mental health issues that we discussed earlier, or her life was truly being threatened, or she had taken drugs and her body decomposed to the point where they just hadn't been picked up, or maybe she had metabolized all of the drugs before she had died. I don't really know exactly how that works, but I'm sure an expert pathologist knows a lot more than I do, so if he says that they should be able to find drugs at this stage of her decomposition and they didn't, and that that shows that she didn't take any drugs, then I believe what he has to say. So now going back just a bit, in December of 2015, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Tim Sinney announced that the FBI was officially joining in on the investigation. The FBI had been previously working with them on the searches for the victims before, but they had never officially been a part of the investigation. Then by June 23rd, 2016, in a very tragic turn of events, Shannon's mother, Mari Gilbert, was murdered in Allenville, New York. Now, as I mentioned before, Shannon's sister, Sara, she had a very difficult life growing up. She suffered a lot of abuse growing up and she had suffered domestic abuse. However, after Shannon went missing and all of these details of these other victims being found and the horrific situation that was going on, it is said that Sara just could not handle it mentally. She seemed to spiral. Now, she had been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and she fell hard into drug use. By February 19th, 2016, with her son Hayden still in the home, Sara drowned the family dog in the bathtub. So, some articles say that this was done right in front of Hayden. Some other sources also claim that Sara took Hayden into the woods and threatened to kill him too after showing him that she had killed the family dog but I did only see this in a couple of sources, so I don't know if this was just added for shock value or if this is something that really happened. That day, Sara called her mom to let her know that the dog just had to die. That was her reasoning for drowning the dog. Mari, who lived just down the street, of course, she rushed over to the home to grab Hayden and call the police. After that, she ended up in a law enforcement-run psychiatric facility. She spent a couple of months there, all the while Hayden continued living with Mari. When Sara was released, it was decided that Hayden would be living with Mari for the foreseeable future. Because of this, Sara was no longer receiving the government checks from Hayden that she needed to pay her bills. She was frustrated angry, and she refused to take the prescription medication that she had been prescribed for her schizophrenia. In early July, Sara had overdosed on a drug, either on LSD or ecstasy, but it's not known exactly which one. But either way, after being in the hospital from her overdose, it was said that she was so combative that she had to be placed into a medical coma to prevent her from harming herself or the hospital staff. When she was released, she was supposed to be getting injections for medication to stabilize her mood, but once again, she refused to take her medication. Over the course of the month, Sara completely isolated herself. She stayed inside of her home and she cut off all contact with her mother, Mari, who was just trying to help her in any way that she could. She was convinced at this time that Mari was actually trying to kill her. So, on the morning of July 23rd, 2016, Sara called her sister, Sherry, to tell her that she had started hearing voices again. Sherry told her to go to the hospital, but she refused, so she was told to at least call their mother for help. So, she did, and Mari rushed over to her home to help her. But at this point, Sara was convinced that her mother did not want to help her. She thought that she had it out for her. So, as she awaited for Mari to arrive, she grabbed a 15-inch kitchen knife and placed it under a pillow next to the couch. She also grabbed a fire extinguisher and put that within reach as well. By 10.30 a.m. that same day, Mari arrived and she sat next to Sara on her couch to talk to her. During the conversation, Sara had asked Mari if she was an evil god. In some retellings, Sara says that her mother denied it. 
in other retellings, Sara said that her mother admitted that she was an evil god. As they talked, Mari noticed some really cute pictures of Sara and Hayden, and she smiled. She started reaching for the picture, sort of as a conversation piece, but as she did, Mari pulled out the knife and started stabbing her mother. As Mari tried getting away, Sara continued stabbing her until she fell onto the floor. Once on the floor, Mari tried getting under a coffee table to try and get away, but Sara pulled her out from under the table, sat on her, and continued stabbing her. At this point, Mari's phone was ringing because Sherry was actually calling her, so Sarah got up to go and turn it off, but in this moment, she actually grabbed the fire extinguisher and started hitting Mari in the head with the fire extinguisher over and over and over again. She wanted to do whatever it was that she could to make sure that Mari would die, so she sprayed the fire extinguisher directly into Mari's mouth to make sure that she would stop breathing. Then she stabbed her mother in the neck, and she is thought to have done so in an attempt to decapitate her, but she didn't. I honestly can barely even describe this situation because of how brutal it is. It makes me really uncomfortable. I'm sure it makes you really uncomfortable. It's just so much. There's just so much going on here. It's so, so heinous and brutal. But either way, after this, Sarah was obviously covered in blood, so she went and changed, and then she went and laid down in her bed. At some point, Sherry knew that something was probably wrong, so she went over to Sarah's house and started pounding on the doors, and she tried looking inside, but she couldn't get in, so she knew that something had to be going on, so she called the police. By 1.45 p.m., police showed up and started knocking on Sarah's door, Sara answered, and police asked her if she knew why they were there, and she said, I am under arrest. And of course, she was arrested. Now, upon autopsy examination, it was found that Sara stabbed her mother, Mari, 227 times. When she was asked why she did this, she said that it was because she needed to have her mom dead, because her mom was evil. For this, she was sentenced to serve 25 years to life in a state prison, which is the maximum time allowed. It was said that the judge prosecuting her case said that if he had anything to say about it, Sara will never walk free again, but he is going to push for her to get the mental health care that she clearly desperately needs. So clearly, Sara was very, very, very mentally unwell. She clearly had some very, very, very strong delusions about her mother who helped her in any way that she could. She helped him raise her son and she provided for her and him in any way that she could. Yes, Sara had a very difficult time growing up, some of them as a direct result of her mother's choices, but she did not deserve to be killed with this level of brutality. It's something that I can't even fathom a daughter doing to her mother. Again, I understand that Mari had some bad men coming into the house. She made some very bad choices. She put Shannon into foster care. She did some really bad things, but everybody has really difficult lives and some are much more difficult than others and Mari was doing her best to make up for the mistakes that she had made in her past. Once she was in a position to better herself, she did that and she did whatever she could to make the lives of her children better because she knew that she made a lot of mistakes. So yes, there are a lot of things that Mari did but she did not deserve this in, in one bit. She did not deserve this level of brutality. So with this whole other side case happening, I know this is a lot to take in. So to summarize the entire Gilgo Beach case, we know that after Shannon went missing, there were 10 additional bodies found, only six of them being identified. Then a year and a half after Shannon's disappearance, Shannon's body was also found. The vast majority of the victims were women, and they were very close in age, very close in size, and they were all sex workers, with the exclusion of this one Asian male who is thought to maybe be a transgender, and of course, the toddler. We also don't know about the unidentified victims, but 
we do know that they were women. But with that, there is a list of potential suspects in this case, and that is where we're going to pick up in part two. I know there was a lot that we just went over, but trust me, there is still so, so much more to this case to go over in part two. There is even more to the timeline of Shannon's disappearance that we don't know yet. We will also piece together the victims that we discussed in this video, as well as more victims that could potentially be connected to the Long Island serial killer. Then we will discuss the list of possible suspects, who they are, and how they may be connected to this case, and why they may be the Long Island serial killer. So please make sure you keep out for part two because you are not going to want to miss it. But either way, thank you all so much for being here for the first video of Creep Week. I am actually making Creep Week into two different weeks, so you definitely are not going to want to miss next week either. I should have called it Creeps Weeks or something like that because I'm spanning over two weeks, but it doesn't really matter. I'm making three to four videos for Creep Weeks. I know this video is going to be two parts. I haven't quite decided if next week's video is going to need two parts or not. We will see next week, but I am so excited about this case. I've put so much time and effort into this case. I've tried to piece together so many things for you guys. Once again, I will apologize. My voice is now getting more raspy near the end of the video. I feel like I'm less um, nasally now and more just like raspy and like hoarse. Um, so I do apologize for that. Hopefully by the time I record part two, I... I'm feeling a little better. Not that I feel sick, but my throat obviously is a little bit dry and I'm a little nasally. So hopefully it's a little better on that aspect of it. But thank you all so much for sticking with me through this video. Again, I know there was a lot. If you have to rewatch this video before you watch part two, I totally understand. But either way, that is where we are going to end part one. With that, make sure you go ahead and give this video a thumbs up if you like the video. And if you are enjoying Creep Week, please let me know in the comments below. Make sure you go ahead and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week, sometimes twice a week. Make sure you go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos and so you don't miss out on part two of the Long Island serial killer case. Make sure you go ahead and use my link down below to get 60% off of your subscription to Babbel. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!